Gamer Nation, and welcome. Wait, this is a different show. Oh, what's up? Here's a review of a video game. Sorry. That, oh, sorry. I'm just sorry. Headhunter is a third person action adventure Verhoeven esque Casio wristwatch ad that was developed by now defunct Swedish studio Amuse, and it was published by Sega for the Dreamcast in 2001, but only in Europe. A year later, however, Acclaim would publish a PS2 port in the US which is the version covered in this video. I could not find much about Amuse. They were based in Stockholm, put out this game and its sequel two years later before closing down due to financial troubles. For the year that Headhunter was confined to Europe, it still received coverage in the US. Because it was released the same month as Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, most publications compared Headhunter to it, and a surprising amount of critics were sort of split on which game prevailed as the best uh, futuristic sneaky spy man game, with some referring to it as a possible MGS killer, unaware that some years later Konami would eliminate the necessity for an MGS killer. My personal history with this game before this recent playthrough was sort of a matter of unfinished business, a quest for absolution. While visiting the local video store, I happened upon a game with this cover and thought, what any person with a thinking brain would. Uh, yeah, gotta play this. Gotta know who this motherfucker is. And Sega knew this, that's why this single right down the barrel shot of the game's lead character is seemingly the only image they wanted or needed for Headhunter's packaging and advertising. So I rented it, and having a somehow worse attention span as a teen than I do now, I just did not get it. I got maybe an hour in, and at the first sign of resistance, the first roadblock I came to, I was just out. I didn't get what the game was going for, I didn't understand the controls, and I selfishly gave up on it. It's still sitting there. I never took it back. I just want you to know the lengths of indifference I showed this game. But the weird thing is, it sort of weighed on me. That $7 from 2002 spent unwisely on a game I gave up on the first night. It haunted me. It haunted me more than the countless dollars spent on Steam games I'll likely not live to play. That sign I made reminding me didn't help either. Though Headhunter received strong reviews for its Dreamcast release, when it made its way to the US on PS2, either time or the porting process wound up hurting its reception. Reviews were still positive, with PSN writing, while it doesn't bring anything truly groundbreaking to the genre, it's executed pretty damn well overall. And Game Informer would write, Headhunter Hunter is not without its blemishes, but I really got into the game. Beaten Metal Gear and wanting more? Get some head. God damn. When all is said and done, it does seem like Headhunter was reviewed well enough and had fans despite not having much of a legacy. As far as I know, it's not available on any digital platform and its name isn't often brought up in the same conversation with Metal Gear Solid or similar titles anymore. I am excited to conclude this incomplete chapter of my life and atone for my wasted rent. What the fuck is this? What is this? What? Undoubtedly, Headhunter's most successful failing is its world, and by extension, its commitment to its inspirations. Over a lengthy sequence of news broadcasts set across several days, we get a pretty detailed picture of Headhunter's setting, seemingly borrowing from films like Robocop, Total Recall, Starship Troopers, and... I, I don't know, Demolition Man maybe? This game is set in a darkly comedic near future LA, one where policing has been privatized, replaced entirely by the ACN or Anti-Crime Network, an organization funded by the government and run by a billionaire industrialist. This led to the creation of Headhunters, trained private contractors that hunt down wanted felons listed on the criminal exchange, assigned a bail set by the government that raises and lowers depending on the severity of their crimes or or the effectiveness of their rehabilitation. Headhunters get a cut of this and the rest goes to the ACN. That is, if the captured felon can pay their bail. If they can't, the ACN's method of recouping this bail is by forcing criminals to become organ donors. Since this is the more likely scenario, the ACN outright banned the sale of guns, and headhunters began using special ENP guns in the place of traditional weapons. Electric neural projectiles attack the nervous system, causing brain death 
but leaving the rest of the victim's organs intact and ready for donation. If this wasn't dystopian enough, the ACN partnered with a corporation called Biotech that are working on a chip to insert into the brains of criminals in the hopes of suppressing aggressive thoughts, with lots of room to expand its uses. Opposing this is an elusive mob boss named Don Fulci, who makes it clear via illegal broadcasts that the ACN and its CEO have created a dictatorship with a private army. He vows to stop them at any cost, but the ACN shows no sign of slowing down their draconian dream for the planet. A new vice president is instated named Alan Sharp, who instills a three strikes and your organs are out rule. After the history lesson, we are introduced to the game's protagonist, Jack Wade. He wakes up strapped to a table in some kind of futuristic lab with no memory of how he got there. After he manages to escape, he passes out, waking up in a hospital a week later. He's clearly undergone some kind of surgery, but he has no memory of it. While he sits in a hospital bed, we are treated to yet more news broadcasts, which are, look, they're really well done, and they are sort of the wraparound, they're the bookend that cements the tone of this story, but also, they really make you sit through a lot of it for a long time before you do anything substantial in this game. I can't deny this does put it in a way in the same wheelhouse as a Kojima game, where you can safely just put the controller down for a while and get comfy. Or you can, you know, do this, make him look like he's running. <laughs> In my impatience for the game to start, I began to wonder how it stacked up to Metal Gear 2 and the other games as far as how long it takes for you to actually begin the game. Not just walk forward, jump over a box, and trigger another cutscene, but like actually start. On the news, they're covering the murder of Christopher Stern, creator of the ACN. They make mention of his distraught daughter, Angela Stern, and that Alan Sharp will be instated as his successor. It's not certain who was responsible for Stern's assassination, but they float the idea that Don Fulci and a criminal organization called The Syndicate are the most obvious culprits. In an interview, Sharp vows to continue to fight crime and even those with even criminal thoughts. Wade is then visited by his old boss, Chief Frank Hawk. Maybe this will jog your memory. Smith & Easton Stimulator. Stimulator? I barely know. He reveals that Wade used to be the number one headhunter in the league for six years straight before his memory loss. In the interim, some asshole named Hank Redwood has taken over the number one spot. Since his disappearance, he's essentially fired from being a legit headhunter, but he's allowed to go solo provided he starts the license application process all over again. Word of warning. You've woken up with quite a few enemies. I wouldn't trust anyone you don't know. And right now, you don't know anyone. Hmm. That's a pretty good line. Surely now we'll get to play the fucking game. Oh. Okay. Some time later, Wade is visited by Angela Stern. She wants to hire Wade to hunt down and kill Fulci, something the ACN doesn't seem interested in doing, as they're more likely to just shoot a random pedestrian and uh, harvest their organs. She also reveals that Wade was the last person to see her father alive because they were meeting to discuss a secret project, so finding her father's killer will likely reveal whatever happened to him as well. Why she doesn't deduce that Wade seeing her father last would make him more of a suspect than some mysterious mob boss that nobody's ever seen is no business of mine. Get well soon, Jack. And when you do, come pay me a visit. All right, let's play this fucking get god damn it so i guess wade goes to angela's place and gets a little more background on her father and alan sharp how he influenced the presidential election that led to law enforcement being privatized you can use my bike to get around town relic from my wild days but it still works fine nice body work for a relic hmm. <laughs> Were you hitting on her? Was that what you were doing? You were looking at her in the eyes when you said relic. I would I would guess that wouldn't go over well, but I mean, on the other hand, look at this guy. Jeez. First things first, Wade needs to start his Layla exams over, a VR training course that ranks you from C to AAA. Down at the offices, we meet Hank Redwood, who gloats about being the new number one. And if Wade wants his spot back, he's gonna have to climb over him to get it. He's finally kitted out with a gun and a communicator watch. 
which seems to turn him into a monkey. <laughs> he does not have the backing of the ACN though, so he can't just Google Fulci's known accomplices. Since they're former buddies, Chief Hawk allows him an entry-level clearance, which is just enough to learn about a guy named Grey Wolf, who is known to associate with the Syndicate. One thing I really do have to give this game credit for is offering in-world explanations for game mechanics. Biotech's criminal tracking chip allows them to show up on your mini-map if you're close enough, but Syndicate members have found some means of disabling their other functions and can freely commit all the crimes they want provided they are careful. The game also takes any opportunity to offer up a little bit of satire. Even the loading screens display goofy propaganda posters with slogans promoting the ACN or making sure your child grows up healthy and thus their organs do as well, or offering you services like an exam that would determine if your partner will cheat on you sometime in the past, present, or future based on their DNA. See if they got the cheater gene. The same tech being used to sniff out people with the crime gene, so you can slap the cuffs on them before they even try to download a car. There are still plenty of cutaways to the news segments, where you're updated about things like black market organ trading and the Border Patrol capturing organ rustlers. Some of these sound more plausible than others. The U.S. threatened to withdraw all hamburger franchises from Russia. See, I could see this happening. Obviously, if you haven't picked up on it, one of the clearest sources of inspiration for Headhunter is Robocop, a film that features a great deal of social and political commentary. In a parodic reflection of the era's filmmaking, it touches on police militarization, late-stage capitalism, our relationship with the media, and desensitization to violence, alongside very entertaining scenes of people getting their dicks blown up, pairing the excess of the 1980s with an equally absurd amount of violence. But there is also an emotional core to it, an exploration of humanity, of how much of it is left after corporate greed has vacuumed it from the planet. It's still prescient and eerily prophetic year after year, as are a lot of things that used to be satire but turned out to be more of a roadmap. You can see where Amuse got a lot of their ideas for this game, from the saccharine, cheerful talking head segments to ads for brand name organ replacements, and more clearly a corporation creeping its fingers and influence into law enforcement, and using unchecked science to tinker with people's humanity. Headhunter wants to do this as well, and sometimes I think it is doing it. Other times I kind of forget what it's doing because I'm just blowing myself up. Maybe that's some kind of satire though. It's telling me that trying to fight capitalism is, is futile. It's telling me the proletariat will lose their ability and drive for revolution. That's what it's saying every time I blow my stupid ass up. There are three basic categories of union activity you need to be on the lookout for. While different on the surface, they should all be treated as dangerous situations. It's wild that in the span of like 30 minutes, I've only shot some guys in a hallway and did a tutorial segment. The rest has been a movie. The first real assignment we get to go on is hunting down Grey Wolf. And if talking about that any further could be considered spoilers, I will cut it off there and you can seek out this game and experience its story on your own by skipping to this time, then going to your local video store and renting Headhunter for the PS2. Or if you don't give a sh fuck, then keep on watching. So take a minute to decide if that's what you want to do. Hello. The fuck? It's your buddy Chad. I don't remember establishing anything about our relationship. Maybe you can help me out. I am stuck inside some kind of void. How'd you get there? I don't know, but I can see everything. Information. Information? Yes, I have access to quite a bit of information, including information about you. Me? What do you know about me? Do me a favor. Hey, do me a favor. All right. Stay here. I'll check back with you later. Yeah, I gotta delete some shit. Wade chases Grey Wolf all over town until he finally corners him on the roof of a building, where he is left dangling off the edge. There is some strange dissonance in the fact that I pumped this guy full of brain-killing bullets, and it only seems to wind him. But it's a game, and I at least understand that I am the victor. In this moment, defeated, he is willing to spill what he knows about the Syndicate and Don Fulci, if Wade saves him. These two seem to immediately reach some kind of understanding, both belonging to different factions of Guns for Hire, overseen by two different rich assholes vying for power. Grey Wolf last heard that Fulci is on a cargo ship called Queen of Hearts, transporting black market organs. Wade arrests him as now that he's given up his boss, he likely wouldn't live long on the outside. Even though we 
we've apprehended a well-known criminal and scattered his gang, Wade isn't part of the League anymore, so Hank Redwood winds up getting the credit. In the interstitial news break, we learn about Biotech's popular power drink, Xmust. Perhaps in an attempt to distract from the controversy surrounding their work with mind control and a recent viral outbreak in one of their labs, they've begun a welfare program to provide Xmust to schools and hospitals. Right now, this doesn't seem like an important plotline, but you are shown the ad for this fucking drink over and over again, and there is a payoff to it, so it's worth noting. Wade returns to Angela's to update her on the search for Fulci, but he finds her house empty, and on the news they're reporting about a group of syndicate terrorists that have kidnapped her and are holding her hostage at a shopping mall. It's really adorable that so many people thought there would still be malls in the future. I mean, I kind of miss it, but I can still emulate the experience by just getting lost in a parking lot while shopping on the Hot Topic app. Buy myself a, uh... <laughs> what the fuck do they sell there now? Oh no. Oh no. I'm so old. Hawk is under orders from the ACN to not get involved, so the best he can do to help Wade is suggest that he enter the mall through the sewers, also warning him that a psycho at the top of the criminal exchange is working for them, Esteban Ramirez. After fighting our way through syndicate forces, Wade spies on Ramirez talking to one of his henchmen about something called Project Millennium, which they thankfully outlined in a document they left sitting out. Angela was taken hostage mostly as a distraction and a trap for Wade. Meanwhile, another group is going to blow up some kind of internet security device underneath a bank across the street where they will have a moment to siphon a great deal of money out of it before a backup security system takes over. Normally I would completely advocate for the robbing of a bank, but apparently in this world that's bad and we don't want that. We're able to rescue Angela who has a plan to hack the thing in the most ideal way that would make everyone happy. <laughs> I don't know. There is an explanation, but it didn't make sense to me. It's good though. We want her to do- I'm sorry. A Angela? I think there's something wrong with your thorax. So she goes to do that while Wade goes after Ramirez. But she blows up instead. Angela! Oh, never mind. She's okay. Oh. Ramirez attacks Wade with robotic spiders. Go ahead and laugh. Only these babies? They don't die so easy. Oh, fuck! Since he was not immediately responsive to questioning, Wade uses a truth serum they found on a desk earlier was lying around, to get info out of Ramirez, with his first order of business confirming that Ramirez f***ed his sister. You are unnaturally close to your sister, true? Yes! Guess it's working. Because I just, I guess he had that vibe to him. But he also gets him to reveal that even if they stop the transfer, Grey Wolf's gang had arranged a backup plan at their headquarters. Angela and Wade are able to jack into the bank computer and reverse the syndicate's hack, taking all their money and distributing it to the bank customers and wringing them dry. On the way to the next objective, Chief Hawk calls to inform Wade that one of the people he killed at the mall was an ACN agent, and that Alan Sharp is telling the press he has a video of him shooting a fellow headhunter. He also issues a warrant for reckless endangerment of organs, rocketing Wade to the top of the criminal exchange, so both Syndicate and ACN will be on his tail. On the news, Fulci interrupts Alan Sharp, gloating about neutralizing the mall hostage situation, to implore that people restore the syndicate's funds by donating to their PayPal, or they will detonate several bombs placed in different locations around LA, which will level the entire city. Using a handy map left behind by Grey Wolf, Wade races around town disarming each of the bombs, which seems to somewhat restore Hawk's faith in him, but he's soon attacked by Hank Redwood. I don't know why I, I always say his full name, it might just be fun to say. It's got a sort of woody quality about it. Alan Sharp has a press conference where he announces that Hank was responsible for disarming the syndicate's bombs and that he also apprehended the disgraced ACN agent Jack Wade, who's being sent straight to the Aqua Dome, where he'll be forced to participate in televised gladiatorial combat. At this plot point, I feel like it has to click into place what Headhunter is. Once you introduce an underwater prison where convicts are forced to fight to the death on TV, I was like, all right, I, I get what we're doing here and I'm on board. Though this concept is so absurd and takes up such a small part of the game uh, when it could have been the entire premise of it and I'd be okay. It was the point of no return. I had to see it through now even though there's a ton of other shit I could be playing. I could be playing. What's this? What is this? Get the fuck out.
After you defeat some big fucker in the arena, you get a cutscene depicting a series of events so truncated that I received a notification on my phone from a food delivery app I haven't used in a year, and in the time it took me to look at my phone and say, how the fuck do I get rid of these? Grey Wolf had helped Wade escape from the Aqua Dome in an escape pod and coincidentally surfaced right next to Don Fulci's ship Queen of Hearts. I then began to panic, thinking I entered some kind of time wormhole, propelling me 15 minutes into an apocalyptic future. The news, of course, covers this much more charitably as the two of them going on a cruise before entering rehab. Jack is able to make contact with Angela long enough to tell her where he is and that he'll need her help, leading to a segment where you get to play as Angela, breaking into the dock that the Queen of Hearts is headed for. Guard chatter suggests that Wade was immediately captured and Fulci plans to hand him over to the ACN as part of a joint deal with Biotech for some black market organs and stimulators, which is the unfortunate name given to the ENP guns. I mean... They know what they're doing. The stimulator promises responsible gun owners all the thrills of a conventional weapon. I certainly keep a stimulator by my bed, Bill. Absolutely, Kate. Angela is able to board the ship and quickly find Wade, but he blows up and dies. <laughs> no, never mind. He's okay but also learns that an ACN helicopter is on its way to pick him up. She also finds the master disc for Fulci's blackmail message, which she could attempt to decrypt in order to reveal his identity. They split up so she can do that, and you are unfortunately given control of Wade once again as he looks for Grey Wolf. Not being worth the trouble, I guess, Fulci had him killed, which I feel like should have happened on screen. This dickhead wound up being the most relatable and pure-hearted character in the game, and we just find him in a tube. Wade interrogates a guard that tells him nobody knows knows why biotech needs the black market organs, but he's heard rumors they're conducting strange experiments, and they even have a man thing. Having heard enough, Wade knocks him out in the most efficient way possible, kneeing him in the back. Sleep tight. Oh! Oh, yeah. oh, Up top, Wade runs into a guy that looks like he could be the Don, but he's just in charge of smuggling. Either way, don't get attached to him because ACN shows up and blows him away. A still alive and free Ramirez emerges from the chopper, revealing, if I'm tracking this correctly, my brain can only handle so many double crosses, the ACN, Biotech, and the Syndicate had created a symbiotic relationship after the death of Christopher Stern. ACN gets weapons from Biotech, and Biotech gets organs from the Syndicate, but some faction of the Syndicate wanted to cut a side deal to get money off the sale of Jack Wade. And now they just sent in Ramirez to clean up the mess and kill everyone on the ship. But he doesn't. He dies instead. Wade and Angela escape as the ship explodes, but with just enough time to reveal the man in the scrambled message was Alan Sharp. Fulci was sharp all along. To the public, however, Fulci, the prime suspect in Christopher Stern's murder, is at the bottom of the ocean, along with thousands of tons of organs, which I hope is what happens to my organs. Take me to sea. I want to see the ocean. The bottom of it. This news story is quickly sidelined by another story about biotech providing humanitarian relief for a flood by sending victims cans of Xmust. Their top scientist and Robotnik cosplayer Ernst Zweiberg is also being nominated for Personality of the Year and a Nobel Prize. Back at Angela's, she's used the money hacked from syndicate accounts to pay off Wade's bounty. You're a free man again. Looks like I owe you my ass. That and a few other organs. They talk about how Alan has been controlling both sides of this conflict, and it was likely him that killed Angela's father. Chief Hawk calls and sounds like he's ready to defect from the ACN, but he wants to meet in person at Biotech's lab. On the way to the meeting, Wade is once again ambushed by Hank, who has been ordered to kill him and Hawk, replacing him as chief. That is, if he can defeat Wade in a duel, which he does not. <laughs> At the biotech lab, Wade begins to have flashbacks to the procedure that led to his amnesia, and he's confronted by Sharp. Sorry, Wade. I didn't know it was a setup. Of course he didn't. Wade, anytime you want to hop in there, just so loyal. do so your thing, buddy. Dignified. So dead. Okay, we'll get him next time. Like any good villain, he monologues about wanting ACN to control everything. He admits he had Stern murdered after he threatened to end Biotech's experiments with mind control, revealing the grim truth that it was Wade who pulled the trigger while under Sharp's control. The explanation of his reasoning is interrupted when he's killed by Angela, who had been listening the whole time and now trains her gun on Wade. Just then, since all the characters decided to meet up at once, I guess, Spyberg enters and talks Angela down from shooting 
shooting him, explaining that Wade was receiving some kind of advanced mind control surgery. Then he escaped and left his memory damaged. Uh, no. Guy, like, you have to get better at this. Some time later, Wade is strapped to a table, enduring yet another villain monologue, this time from Zweiberg, who explains his plan for a master race, a race of lab-grown superhumans that will replace humanity after they're wiped out by a modified strain of the Ebola virus. Holy shit, that's all chin? They did, they did you dirty, my guy. After drinking a refreshing can of Biotech X-Must, the deadly virus ready to spread rampantly across the globe is triggered by watching some cursed content. Replicase? R-E-P-L-I-C-A-S-E -E protease and I don't know what this word is. Specifically a doctored X-Must commercial that inhibits a seizure of some kind. Angela also wakes up next to Sharp, who has already been harvested for organs. But I guess they didn't see a need to strap her down or kill her because she just gets up and walks out. She frees Jack, but he warns her that he's infected with Zoidberg's virus. Why isn't Angela the main character in this game? Like, I know nothing about her and yet she just handles everything thrown at her. At the start of the game, she's just a lady that wants revenge. I didn't know she knew how to make a vaccine vaccine for a new virus out of the DNA of a lab-grown super mutant? What does Wade know? How to stand impotently while his friends die? Angela, what are you doing down there? Jack, get me out of here! Sh shut up for a second. I think somebody's making chicken nuggies. Be right back. Given control of Angela once again, she goes deeper into the lab and finds Adam, the prototype for this new master race. You know, this whole master race thing you're working on? Um, I have a note. Get away! Don't touch him! <laughs> she fucking killed him! No. Adam wakes up and immediately just destroys his creator. <laughs> and goes after Angela. Luckily, it just chases you around a pillar until it falls over. And she gets the DNA sample from it. Kids today. Angela is able to synthesize a vaccine and runs back to give it to Wade. Meanwhile, Zweiberg is alive enough to inject the defeated Adam with adrenaline, giving it at least enough energy to go down swinging. With the last of his strength, he sends out the trigger to air the doctored commercial globally and activate a self-destruct protocol for the lab. The two of them are able to interrupt the signal by sending it to a different satellite. I guess they hoped it would just be broadcast somewhere where nobody was watching, like Apple TV+, Plus. but this does prevent to the triggering of the virus. Before they can leave, Adam returns with upgrades. Buddy, like, I I'm not even gonna say anything. You know what you did. I I've done my part, and if you don't want to work on yourself, then. The nanites, they're adapting his body, absorbing energy from the bullets, using them to rebuild its defenses. The bullets are healing him? He's adapted to bullets? After blasting a hole through him with a fancy energy weapon. Oh shit, they died! Oh, they're dead! Oh, uh, never mind. It's time to start over. Just you and me and the stimulator automatic. Wait, this is a very romantic situation. Uh, please refrain from saying stimulator. Seems like a pretty ideal ending, right? Well, that night on the news, it seems that in the wake of ACN and biotech falling apart, the governor has insisted that headhunters become more ruthless and less regulated, leading to so many arrests that they have to have weekly gladiatorial cullings at the Aquadome. Things are worse than ever. Also, divers attempting to recover some of the organs after the Queen of Hearts sank. Oh, I just got that. Queen, Queen of Hearts. They start picking up some kind of satellite activity that may be a distress signal. Oh, everybody's dead. Millions are all, all dead. I think there's a lot of fun at the core of Headhunter's story, and its influences shine perhaps a little too brightly throughout. But everything else that takes place during the game's story is pretty generic. It, my weird thing with this game that I've likely overthought about for a goofy shooty game is that Headhunter seems to borrow not only Robocop's sense of humor, it also behaves like a style parody of a film from the 1980s, which I find to be, on one hand, fun, 
Like this game has a much better sense of its own absurdity than many other games did at the time, but it's also a bit of a missed opportunity. In playing Headhunter, I was reminded of one of my favorite games, Harvester, which is a joyously fucked up game that I don't think it would be that much of a stretch to say, as Robocop satirizes and reflects film and politics from the 1980s, Harvester satirized video games and sort of indicts the conservative pearl clutching of the 90s. They both sort of have a thing they're giving the finger to, using their medium. I like that Harvester knows it's a game though, and wants to have this meta conversation about video games expressed through video game rules and tropes. Headhunter wants to be its own thing, but also be a very specific movie. It doesn't want to comment on video games, you know, the thing it is. It wants to do what Robocop did, but it's like, Robocop already did that. I feel like if you already have this well-realized sense of satire, you could do something more transformative and modern than kind of parroting what a movie from the 80s did, but setting it in the early 2000s. I mean, it does at least highlight the grim reality that not much of this 80s material needed to be updated all that much. Honestly, I really like Slade. <laughs> What's his name? James Blaze? Anyway, I love a protagonist that is just some fucking guy with an attitude. He's just a walking one-liner in speed dealer glasses. But I feel like in copying Robocop's homework, they left out the part where the protagonist has like a proper arc. He's got a heart, a soul. He wants for things and has revelations. They sort of set up Wade. Yes, to, uh, to have something similar with his memory loss and the experiments done on him, but none of that has any kind of lasting effect. Like, he got his memory back, and seconds after he realizes he did the bad thing that kicked off the story, the one other person this would affect is making out with him. And maybe that's... that's saying something. Is that satire? Is this game smarter than me? Probably. International weather, well... Don't know that we want to get into this because uh, you have no way of getting there. I don't want to minimize how interesting and playful this world and its premise is. That is what elevates it and makes it adult. But I hardly share the feelings of some of the more glowing reviews for it from the time. That dub it some mature thriller that doesn't dumb things down. It's pretty dumb. Part of that is on purpose, but most of it isn't. I don't need games to be smart. I have a Bioshock tattoo. Obviously, I don't think that. It's just gotta be interesting or fun. It's gotta have something that wiggles its way into your thoughts, fuels your imagination. The important part for me about Headhunter is that I see the spark inside it, that faint vapor of invention. It's deliberately trying to tap into a specific kind of film and mirror it in some kind of homage. And that is straining to keep me interested in it. But it is succeeding because I would play this game sequel now. It was just oddball enough and it's ending wacky enough that I don't see why or how you'd grant this game another entry, but I'd like to see how they do it. Someone cared enough about Headhunter to sink their ship trying to forge a franchise out of it, and sometimes that adds a seasoning to a game barely detectable but stimulating in some sense. A studio died for this. Spooky. Headhunter's gameplay is an odd snapshot of the third-person shooter in flux. Especially with its PS2 port coming out in 2002, it retains the pre-analog stick-friendly, auto-aiming combat seen in games like the Siphon Filter franchise, where a reticle appears on your enemy and judging on some mysterious factors, maybe distance, maybe movement, you may or may not hit what you're aiming at. Like Metal Gear Solid, you can sneak around by pressing yourself up against walls and peeking around corners, but seeing as though Headhunter is more of a shooter, you you may be tempted to use this function as though this were a modern cover shooter, which sometimes works, but you also have to expose your entire body to fire back at the enemy, so it kind of defeats the purpose of cover a lot of the time. My favorite thing about cover is that I can shoot from behind it while some part of me is protected. This ain't doing that. Sneaking, in general, works a little different in this game. For one thing, it's really easy to avoid being spotted or alerting enemies. They don't seem to react to any kind of sound other than gunfire, so you can quite literally sprint up to them and press yourself flush against their body before triggering a takedown. What do we got here? <laughs> nice and sneaky. Something that took me a long time to figure out because I had assumed you'd want to keep your distance from enemies. The fact that you can't aim things where you want and the camera is working against you as well is pretty much the hardest part of the gameplay to 
accept and, and move past. It feels like a choice made to have the game be more accessible, but it's so jank that it creates a whole host of new problems. If there are multiple enemies, you might not immediately be aiming at the one closest to you, or you might aim at a barrel or a rat, which, which you should never do. So you have to press a button to target the next guy, but there's a lag while he does that, and you're probably already being shot at. Also, when using grenades, you don't even have the reticle. You just toss them directly forward at some incalculable distance. What I do like is that, at least for me, I found combat to be sometimes really unforgiving, and it forced me to be really methodical with how I take down certain groups of enemies. It was a faint feeling that would come and go, but sometimes I'd have the, the flicker of the thought, is this a good game? And then, alright, playtime's over. Hey, fucker. I actually really enjoyed all the exploration elements, and there are these really basic item-based puzzles that weren't overly clever or anything, but just chains of find this to get that, to find this to get that. This sort of starts to fade from focus as the game goes on, and other less interesting types of puzzles come into focus, and there's even some early quick time events which I did not know would be making an appearance, so it predictably took me a minute to understand what it was asking me. What? What's over there? Oh, I'm dead. I do like how quickly and abruptly you can die, and how fast it just cuts to the game over screen. There's something almost disrespectful about how little fanfare it gives your death. Boss fights are plentiful, and there is something to them. I think they can be a mixed bag, but I do appreciate that there's a clear intention to differentiate them from normal combat, to create some kind of environmental element or secondary thing you have to do to make the boss vulnerable. Sometimes these ideas are kind of clever, like piloting these robot spiders into a security door that a guy's locked himself into, and sometimes it's just shooting the guy while he's reloading. All of them kind of have this problem, I feel, where they've thought far enough to decide we can't have the bosses be guys with big health bars that are defeated once you deplete the health bar, which is a good place to start. I feel like after that thought, they didn't push much further beyond that and ponder things like, how do we make this a fun challenge? Or how can we make this something other than just repeating the same move over and over until you win? The fight with Angela and Adam really exemplifies this problem. The whole fight is running around a pillar and shooting the same two pipes that release steam and hurt Adam. There is no variable to this fight. You just do the same thing over and over. Run, shoot pipe, you'll do this thing where he runs really fast but not fast enough to catch up with you if you keep running, and then you stop and shoot the pipe. You just run in and shoot. I feel like there's one more thing, one more element you could toss in here, and I don't know anything about game design so I couldn't tell you what that is. Maybe he smashes a pipe you've used too many times, making it no longer a hazard for him, so you gotta lead him towards a different one? I don't know, it's a nice enough boss fight, but in the immortal words of Kate Bush, you do be running. An earlier fight got this right where you have to stand on these platforms that get hit with lightning, but you have to jump off them before it hits you and time it so the boss is standing on it and you're not. You also get some additional fuckers spawning at regular intervals to throw you off. You do have infinite ammo for your pistol, which always seemed to be the best weapon in the game anyway. The other weapons like the machine gun require you to find infrequent ammo drops, but the only other one I got regular use out of was the shotgun because it would take down enemies in one hit if you were close enough. A big piece of this game that I kind of leapt over for no reason in particular is the thing I think I dislike the most, and that's the driving segments. Headhunter is a linear adventure game, but in between missions, you drive a motorcycle to your next objective. It's odd because it's momentarily open world in that you can technically drive to any of the locations you'll wind up going, you just can't do anything there. You can't actually initiate anything other than what your next objective is. I straight up do not like how this motorcycle controls, and also I'm not good at it, also it sucks, also I suck. It's really unresponsive, and I will admit there are aspects of it that I don't like because of my modern gamer brain expectations. Like you can't crash it or damage the environment in any way, it's this static, unchanging plane that does not acknowledge you. The most I can accomplish is making a car stop. Other than that, I may as well not exist. <laughs> The fact that nothing can really happen to you on this bike makes the whole process of traveling from one location to another seem largely there for what? 
flavor. It's not like it's a cool futuristic metropolis, it just looks like Santa Barbara. That would be one thing, but because certain areas are blocked until you meet a level requirement, you do have to drive around literally aimlessly to just log in time behind the wheel. As you drive, a little meter starts rising until you meet the cap. I don't know if there is some more elegant solution to this or something I missed, but I would literally just drive to one end of an area, turn around and go back until this number became the good number. The only downside of crashing your bike is that this number takes a considerable hit, which is only annoying. It's like not only is it boring and pointless, but you have to pay attention to what you're doing, otherwise you'll have to start over? Sometimes they add a timer to driving, and part of me was like, oh cool, some kind of gameplay challenge. Then I remembered I hate being timed. I hate being reminded of time's passage. I guess all the comparisons to Metal Gear Solid weren't completely unfounded. There are striking similarities in game design choices, but not so much in their execution. You've got a similar mini map thing, you can sneak around avoiding enemies, you can throw things to distract them and open them up to being taken out silently. If you're spotted, some exciting music starts up as they start looking around for where you went. Lots of steel and concrete buildings being infiltrated by a tactical spy kind of character. The Layla VR tests are aesthetically similar to the VR training missions, but even compared to Metal Gear Solid, there's just something off and undercooked about a lot of its gameplay. There is stealth, stealth is there, and sometimes it can be helpful, but Headhunter is consistently a shooter. And like the voice on the other side of my wall, it, it wants you to shoot people. Outside of the VR missions, you're only given one mandatory stealth sequence. And even then, it's in a room full of smoke, so you don't even have to follow the principles that they teach you. You can pretty much just sprint to the other side of the room. Where Metal Gear could be described as politically tinged military surrealism. You know, where one moment clones, one of which is a ninja, fight a vampire in the shadow of a Gundam. And then the next you sit through an hour-long lecture on the necessity of denuclearization. Headhunter is more of a goof. It's a nihilistic joke world where everyone has become complacent and locked into a cruel, unfair economic system that does not work, enforced by people who should be protecting the public but are more likely to just blow people away, and thus is much closer to reality. Hello. Oh, hey, Chad. How do you know who I am? What do you mean, how do I know you? You keep hacking me. Oh, right. I was just looking at information, right? I found your private stuff. What? Looks like news. It would be a shame if I sent them to the Chinese government. What would that accomplish? I don't know. Never mind. Sorry. Chad, are you trying to blackmail me? I saved as many as I could. They only had two of your people. Don't ever use that phrase again. Worth at least 20 credits. 20? Uh, I could buy 20 things with that. Jesus. Tell me something. What's what's the lighting like? What do you mean? Dark or no? Does it matter? I'm, try I'm trying to assess the damage here and see if it's worth it. Please. I'm out of money. Why are you always broke? What, what do you spend so much money on? I'll check back with you later. Poor guy has a problem. Headhunter has some visual charm to it, even if it does look and feel like a budget title, which is likely because it's a port, but it also just has a generic look to it for most of the game. The later half throws in some labs and a mansion that look really fun and show off some cool textures and little uh, pseudo-scientific readouts and gizmos, but it doesn't have a problem making things look acceptable. I actually really enjoy all the item models, there's an extra grain, a polygonal grit to them that's really nice, and some of the more cluttered looking environments environments, especially when they lock you into a fixed camera angle, ooh, really makes me want to wake up tomorrow. It just rarely seems to want to depict anything other than believable and mundane locations. You know, a mall, a bank, a boat, and so forth. A big deciding factor on whether or not I like the way a game looks is its rats, and I'm pleased to say these are very good rats. I would frequently just stop and watch them skitter around. Can't say I find the rat death meter at the end of the game all that amusing, but- Wait, why is there one? What did I do? <laughs> Cutscenes, the ones that aren't FMV, are kinda rough. It's always odd when they look worse than an in-game animation. Just smoother, more awkward, everyone kinda skulks around like a marionette, and sometimes their fingers phase through each other's bodies. The news segments are fantastically made and performed, even though there sh sure is a fuckload of them. And I feel like there could stand to be less. I imagine they were proud of how those turned out and thought, oh yeah, put as, as much of that in there as you can. Skip button? Why would anyone skip this? I mean, I guess you could put one in. It's, it's a little weird though. Two wheels or four? 
with road accidents costing body parts and Grey Wolf's Wolfpack biker gang riding high on the criminal exchange, we ask, does riding a motorcycle make you a bad person? Shoot Not now, please. I'm Shoot trying to... People. I'm doing something. These two are killing their roles as overly cheerful news anchors in the face of truly dystopian news. The whole time I kept thinking, they looked familiar, and I realized it was because this guy, Mark Caven, used to be part of a UK-based alt-comedy troupe called The Comic Strip, which produced a show called The Comic Strip Presents in the early 90s. The only possible explanation is that they were taken by some extraterrestrial force. And then a much shorter-lived sister series called The Glam Metal Detectives, which they both wound up on, that featured these, like, rapid-fire sketches meant to simulate channel surfing. So, Ted, you love Gina? I do. And you love Ted? Oh, I sure do. We're gonna break this marriage up right after this. Though interesting in concept, uh, this format was kind of hit or miss, but every once in a while, one would land. I, I am, however, not too surprised that the show kind of vanished without a trace. I didn't need to describe any of this, but I spent a lot of time not writing and just watching these shows for literally no fucking reason. So I need this to be relevant. In any case, these two are a lot of fun, and I'm glad they got some work. All the voice acting is quality. This is a legit cast of voice actors, which seems to be uncommon in the games I cover. The soundtrack, firstly, is great, but also weirdly out of this game's budget, it seems. I mean, I don't know, this could have been a very expensive game, but this just seems far classier th than I would think this game would get. Because it's like a legit action film score that has this grand cinematic feeling to it. Well, you got the Casio shout out and even a Wells Fargo one. That's just like on the, on the side of a street you pass by, so maybe somebody was paying for this. Like a lot of parts of the game, it has its generic moments. But there are certain tracks like Jack's theme that are so full of triumphant brass up the ass that you, you can't help but feel like a badass. Like you just shot a bazooka at a truck transporting illegal parrots and you slightly pull down your Oakleys to say, Foul ball. It's easy to get me on board when you mix orchestrations with synthetic drum and bass backing, but it's also just always there. It's always assaulting you. There's no way to lower its volume. Pausing it doesn't stop it. It is dragging you, kicking and screaming into an action movie nightmare. This sort of epic, heroic sound seems to be what the composer excels at. You take a track from his score for Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, and you could pretty much plop it in this game and I wouldn't notice. For me, personally, what the soundtrack is missing is one really poorly aged, licensed new metal song to play at the end. From a band that had one noteworthy hit and then disappeared into obscurity, and it's not even the original, it's like a remix. And I will publicly make fun of it, but privately have it on uh, like a workout playlist. <laughs> One of the worst games for PS2. This game was made by Sega. Being made by Sega, I didn't expect much, but I also didn't expect this junk either. For starters, the camera angles work against you in this game. The motorcycle is your means of getting around. The motorcycle is the worst part in the game. Whenever you run into something, you just stick there and you don't move. You never fall off the bike or wreck for that matter. The main character hardly talks even though he's got a voice that suits him. The graphics are horrible. You ride through trees on your bike. The camera makes fighting the enemy impossible. The game wouldn't even be worth renting. There's some valid criticisms here. I do think Jack should have more dialogue and more personality because anytime they do give him a one-liner of some kind, he, he pulls it off pretty great. My friends, they call me the cyber cowboy. The rest of us call you asshole. I am interested to know if the driving segments are a reflection of what the developers intended. Like, is this what they had on paper? Was it to pad out an already pretty short game? Because it seems halfway between several ideas and I don't really get why it wasn't just cut. It's this weird, useless appendage to a game that could otherwise be a straight line. I would say it is interesting enough for a rental. I feel like this game works better under the mindset that you are renting it if that makes sense. Uneven at best. All games like this will be compared to Grand Theft Auto 3, a big city environment in which you can explore and in the meantime advance the story. 
This does not measure up in the least. I'll start with the good. There's a stab at the story. The in-between movies appear to make a good effort at advancing the story. This guy likes advancing the story. Other than the fact that the mystery as to who's behind it isn't much of a mystery. The animation is pretty well done. Also, the new shorts at the beginning and in between are great. They make a great attempt at bringing the world to life. The graphics are great, and I like the fact that you can enter buildings and shoot up the place. I like the idea of riding on a motorcycle through the city, something that should be incorporated into GTA Vice City. That's about it. And now the bad news. The load times between the scenes and locales is way too long for my tastes. There's a lot of waiting. The objects you're supposed to get aren't always easy to spot and I felt like there wasn't a lot of gamer testing for this. This frustrated me quite a bit. The skill points you're supposed to earn in between licenses seem stupidly earned. You ever just like read somebody else's words and you're like, wow, this is so far removed from how I would say anything. Drive fast and not crash, huh? Seems like more of an afterthought than a requirement. There's a lot of convoluted puzzle solving that certainly makes the game more frustrating because it does seem like the gamer testing was used on this either. What? Or if it was, it was ignored. When you're riding through the city, where are the people? Also, you can't dismount and walk the sidewalks except in certain spots. Very limited. Rent if you must, but do not buy. I think you're being a little dramatic, but again, I'd say it is a valid criticism that the driving segments feel like an afterthought. I never even realized that there weren't any people walking around. I, I guess I never questioned it because I forgot what it's like out there. I can't imagine it helped that GTA 3 came out a year earlier and sort of rewrote what is to be expected from an open world experience. So when you're given control of this dude on a motorcycle for the first time, you think, oh, it's like a GTA. And then you realize, oh right, it said Headhunter on the box and not GTA. Got a hard disagree on the puzzle difficulty. They are incredibly logical and easy to follow. To give you an idea of how these work, you walk up to a door that's boarded up and Jack says he needs something to take the boards off. So you go find a crowbar and take the boards off. There's like a little reticle that pops up when you're close to it. This is like the extent of their complexity. He's telling you what he needs. Maybe you should try listening. Metal Gear Solid Junior clone. Let me first start out by discussing the bad points since there are just a few. I don't know how to ride a real motorcycle. I'm scared of them, but it would probably be easier for me to overcome my fear of riding one in real life than one in the video game. The controls are horrible. Also, who thought of that stupid simulator you have to go through in order to upgrade your license. That was ridiculous. Besides these two headaches, I thoroughly enjoyed the game. I couldn't get enough of the hide and peek around the corner ability. The intelligence of the enemies was up to par as well. I would have rated it five stars if you could turn up the gore level and include blood, but that's okay. This is a pretty fair review. I like this one. It was a little short, but a piece of heaven compared to that worthless no one lives forever game. this dude. Cool motorcycle. 16 tests to pass before you can play the game. Ah! After you pass the skills tests from the storyline, you can't actually begin the game until you pass 16 Layla, name of HQ, tests to get your bounty hunter's license back. No real gameplay until you complete all 16 Layla license tests. So, I just ride around town on the motorcycle. You can feel the leans on the bike, but God forbid you hit something. You can't back up or turn around or get off the bike again. Ah! I paid $8.95 for this game and that was too much. I, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I'm guessing you just stopped playing it at some random point and then filled in some imaginary reason why you couldn't keep playing it? Like you were actively playing it. You were playing the gameplay. You don't have to do all 16 tests before you play the game. Like this is all scripted. It's part of the plot you, that you do it incrementally. The tests are part of the game that you're playing with gameplay. Did you get to the screen with the tests and say, oh, fuck this testing, I'm out. Which to be fair is what I did, but I was like, 13 when I did that, and thus legally a stupid asshole, or you just fully bought into the world and you just couldn't wait for Jack to get his headhunter's license back. I need it now, I gotta get back to work!
Not that the question really needed to be taken seriously, but is this game better than Metal Gear Solid? More imaginative or engaging? Uh, no, no, not even a little bit. I do, however, think it is an interesting little oddity, released in the space between other more successful games with similar themes and gameplay. It's a tough idea to pull off, maybe because a lot of games, certainly at the time, indulged in that B-movie extremity that Headhunter is trying to tap into ironically. It's sort of making that the jumping off point for humor, but a lot a lot of games did this sort of thing earnestly, so I'm sure that didn't really translate for a lot of people, especially if you're skipping the new segments, since that is where the theme of the game is most distilled. It's ultimately a fun, if disposable, story that gave me a few exhales through the nose. It's got real uneven gameplay that, especially looking back now, will seem really counterintuitive and like you're unlearning how much third-person shooters have been streamlined, but there is some enjoyable shootouts and puzzles as well. It's not the most interesting game from a design standpoint, it envisions a near future that looks pretty identical to modern day, with the exception that people talk on their wristwatches, which we can do, but wearable tech is kind of a niche boutique thing that isn't all that necessary when you have a phone. Um, but I suppose if they nailed the future, this video call interface would be some kind of third party app that had ads interrupting your calls. Hello there. Oh hey, how's it going in the void of the internet? Sucks. Well. You know, I wish I cared enough uh, to help you out. Hey, remember way back when I tried to blackmail your ass? Yeah, that was like 10 minutes ago. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, that takes a lot to say, and I appreciate. <laughs> what the fuck is this? What? It's a bunch of. Hey, fuck you, ass. I'm never gonna pay for the premium version. That's it, that's the end of the video. Thank you for watching it, and thank you for your patience in between videos. I had to move very unexpectedly and make this in between that and that was uh unpleasant but it's done we're back on track we're making content and uh thanks for sticking around if you would like to there are many ways you can support the channel in the description these things include patreon uh, paypal merch discord twitter whatever you want whatever whatever you want i'd appreciate it and um also sorry for being behind on names for like two months but hey maybe i'll catch up sometime uh but an extra special thanks to ailing uncle two password for kids alex 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 raymond alexander smith alexander sundon andre perkins baird brown ben carnell pizza shift daphne pittendry dark raptor 86 do you know mike oxlong I don't know that. Dr. Beard, Dos Days, Edward Avila, Fart Mother, Freaking Bamboozler, Game Master, Garrett Gavinus, Gody McGork, Jay Alamin, Joseph Zanoni, Carrot, Marcus Chani, Mundane, Nekot the Brave, Nicholas Nelson, Newstime, Knox, Octo, Oisto, Philip Woolley, Roland, Salvatore Tosti, Zemi, Stuka Bliat. <laughs> Can't tell if I'm getting better or worse at that. This deal is getting better all the time. Turts, whip it out. XX Dark and Streams fan XX. Crash Punk, Avanerve, Face, Giraffa, Sergey Voronsov, A Hanging Chad, Amjad Alek, Brady the Sanity Tax Collector, Brozuf Jones, Cantankerous, Donut Stalker, Dubs, High Food Court, Ishanji, Mad Monty 98, Mirden Emery, Snuffy's Hook, Ophelia Fishwife, P. Dizzle, Persian Air, Robert Brandon, Samuel Ward, Technica, A Guy in a Jacket, Alistair Stewart, Alexander Ulbrich, Alexander Schultz, Andrew Light, Andy Krieger, Atari Steed, Ben and Kara Dowling, Big Honk, Bishy93, Brandon McFadden, Brett Weaver, Brody Gibson, Colby, Colt of Lita, Dan Cullen, Daniel Streb, David Frumke, David Harpstrike, Dazed Clockwork, Example Username, Haley Bobella, Hitoshi-san, Jake Desi, Jake Raynor, James Bloom, June Choi, Jordan Balzano, J Raptor, June, Captain Ketchup, M, Mandalore Gaming, Max Cohen, Maximum Stupid, MCR, Michael, Miles Phillips, More Sharks, Mystical Lint, Name Requires DLC, Nick Hill, Nick Timmons, Oliver Marshall, Opichi Costra, Quinn McElroy, Robert Robert, Ruibisomem, Scoffladi, Saab Akadoka, Spooky, Swood Operator, Travis Houston, Vincent Cronin, Stianek Benez, 4 Hour Depression Nap, Adam Page, Adrian, AI, Alec Dye, Alexander McConnell, Anarchy Parrot, Andre Kalganov, Aratak, Eris Alessandrakis, Arshis Knight, Aubrey, Austin Scott, 
Barbecue Jr., Beardicus, Ben Saxon, Ben White, Benjamin Judah Phelps, Big Cheese 1000, Binary Vision, Bindle, Blotherus, Bloodclad Mentality, Boris Rombolt, Brendan Naftal, Byron Callan, Calavera, Cannon Go Boom, Cat Hands, Chris Jordan, Chris Tallarico, Clay Catlin Loves You, Colin Boyd, Colton Rowe, Kamiha, Commissar, Connor Sullivan, Cortland Crochet, Crispy, DS Carmen, Delaminek, Dan Richardson, Daniel Person, Dark Cloud 402, David Quinn, David Offer, Declan J. Keen, Der Commissar, Dilda, DJ Necroman, Doxapine, Dreadhead, Dry County Blues, Edward Crawford, El Jazguar, Enzo, Ersandro, Yulino7, Exidium JTR, Fazy, Fix My Brain, Frodo Ballbag, Jeremy Tibbles, Greg Buchold, Greg McKee, I would rather prefer to remain anonymous, INTJ loves her INTP, Evo Zap, J Marshall, Jared Siri, J Dog 3433, Jean Philippe Malouin, Jessica, JK, Jim J, Joe Face, Jojo Evans, Jovan Jameson, Justin Stewart, Khalil Corey, Chris Odie, KS, Lori Kubri, Lazar Nachekov, League of Struggle, Leland Miliokis, Leon Holmes, Leon Hooks, LGX, LL0X, Lorelei, Lost Via Domus, Lucas Kettner, Major Millions, Mangy Mongrel, Matt Bastard, Megan Carmody, Micah J. Best, Michael King, Michael Monster, I feel like that used to be spelled different. Michael Pelican, Mike Garza, Mocha, Moonpix, Mr. Stark, Mr. Bujangles, Q-Chan, Nameless, Nikita Denisov, Nuan Sonar, Olympus 3DX, Omar Yid, Otter Soldier, Papa Perk, Pen Knight 89, Petrus Montanu, Pikati, Please Keep Making Videos, Ronin, Roosevelt's Big Stick, Roy Gendron, Sagis Atchis, Skoss 117, Scott Aldridge, Sean, Sean Clausen, Sergey Vidovin, Sleepy Poss, Smokey Jefferson, Sonata Fanatica, Spaceman Spiff, Spider, Splort Dusky, seventh of his name. Steinuel, Steph Van Andel, Steve, Strakinia Rodenkovich, Sweet Pete in the Kickstart Apothecary's Backseat, Sydney Steverson, T Grim, we've heard your Dean and your Sam. Now do Castiel. Castiel just sounds like a guy doing Dean's voice, but not actually Dean. Oh, uh, uh, I'm the one who gripped you tight and kissed you on the mouth. <laughs> Terranism, The Sleepiest Sarah, Tino Richter, Titan, Totally Not a Mimic, Trenton Wilkins, Turbo Bra, Tyler F, Yargar, Vivitis, Volpix Chick, Ween Supreme, Yak Spiker, Eve's Yangs, Zachariah I Am, Zin, 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 Zubertuber, Arsile Markusen, A Perfectly Normal Human and Definitely Not a Dog That Learned How to Use a Computer, AJ Leroy, A.L. Carpenter, A Bonkers Chicken, Adolin Seed, Adrian Fauci, Adventure Game Geek, Alex Hanna, Alexis Pinsenalt, Anthony Daniel, Austin Mathis, Baker, Big Hubert, Boop Butt, Brad, Brian Sanson, BS Fam, B Salpy, Kaz, Chicken Legs, Christian Danny Storgard, Christopher White Schneider, CMG161, Creepy Lounge Lizard, Krylar, Dale Walden, David Moreau, Dizzy Rogue, Drenched, Drunk Taco, Dina, Earth Go Hard, Fabulous Freckles, Feeder Goldfish, Gamercot, Gamesbrit, Gargantua, Gato Malo, Half Asian Viking, Harry Sykes, Hashi Singh, Herb Messiah, Hinchus, Homeboy Dirtbag, We Lay, Ignacio de Guglielmi, IP68, Isabella Stoner, Jed Grahek, Jeep Pete, Joe Reynolds, Johan Cavand, John Z, Jonas Kingo, Jonathan Becker, Jonathanis Eddy, Josh B, Joshua McLarnin, Yoni Niamela, Yuha Kauri, Kakun, Karen Mayville, Kevin Thurber, Krampic Newt, Laz Lowe, Lucas, Lucian Jelly, Level Zero, Matthias Waltman, Melly, Melon, Mind Like Water, Myargar, Niall McCorkendale, Nicholas Monroe, OK Cat Dad, Ombud, Padden Franklin, Pedro Costum, Phony Soprano, Piotr Senkowski, Professor Nex, Project Belurient, Pixelfish, Raven6677, Rana Banana, Resurrection, Ricky Goss, Ricky Rigatoni, Rith, Roast Samson, Rotten Hams, Ryan Hollinger, Ryan McLeod, Sam C, Sam Myers, Samich, Schluff, Schwabalaba, Sean McDonald, Seaway Jerk, Sentient Turtle, Sir Tristan, Silvano Gonzalez, Sinan the Montoya, Sir Alohomora, Slava Saknienko, Slavic Dreams, Solarbox, Stephen Laflame, Subdermal Cassette Loader, Super Dunman, Sven Grell, Sinoy, Sira Prize, Tatami Guy, Tax Deductible, TDGW, Test Dunn, The Gaming Beehive, Little B, The Great Mutato, The Real Kal El, The Magnificent Spud, The Super Pickle, Thomas Jackson, Uncle Dozer TV, Val Halverson, Valinora, Visitor Information, Warhopper, Whiskey Grenade, 
Your patron, Yuko Vallis, ZJ, One Iserlo, Adrian, Alberto, Ferreira, Valverde, Alex Armibull, Alex Yui, Allegory, Alpaca Omega, Feeder of Blood, Anna Trans Rights Exo, Anders Evinrud, Andre Kurenkov, Anna Nuff, Ass Blaster 49, Astro Shepard, Asroy, Bertigan, Basti, Benjamin Payne, Bertie Bertig, Big Death Energy, Big Danger, Bit Matter, Bloodworth, Bo, Bobson Jr., Boyi, Brand Faust, Brandon Shock, Bubblegum Curapop, Buckaroo, Cabbage, Cam, Cassidy Mosier, Chalabard, Chef Toker, Chonko Ronko, Chris, Chris Barb, Chunkus Manhunkus, Clinton Attaway, Cloister 56, Conrad Eastman, Cryptid John, Dalton McCabe, Dan Zinsky, Daniel Gen, Daniel Newberry, Daniel Pena, Danny D, Dantec K3, David Bansinski, Dead Alewives, Delta, Damar, Dezu, Div, Deveth Faust, Domingo Carlo Martinez, Dust Sucker, Edmo Filo, Edward McQuinn, Edward Wheeler, Eggs McOmelet, Emmett Arthur, Epic Dude 467, Eric Leong, Eric Lawn, Eugene. Gene Balder, Fitzgerald 93, Florian Vogel, Francisca Dimitrovska, Frank, Frantic Atlantic, Freaky Demon, Franz, G. Braiding, Genuine Chillcast, Gianni Matragrano, Gideon Joubert, Guy, Guifa, H.L. Longboy, Hannes Jacoby, Hazel Connor, Haimo Statman, Hoffleran, I Am So Cool and Grim, I Fall Down, Ian, Ian Baranek, Ikifu, Incorrect Beans, Inside My Strange Place, Isaac, Jacob Hanley, Jacob Gardner, Jalcor, James Lambert, JCL 300, Jick Magger, John Adams, John John Araujo, John Brumley, John Kamich, John Stone, Joshua Can, Joshua Stewart, Justavian, Khalifas, Casey Gould, Kekkan Sehin, Kimia, Kirano, Kyle Williams, Lefazar, Lara Harwood, Lauren, Lauren Miller, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, Louis Quinn Whalen, Liam, Low C, Lucas Mendel, Luke Gazaway, Lynn Lovett, Monolith, Magno Dick, Manu Weidman, Mara Elena, Matt Clark, Matt M, Matt Chester, Matthew Arrowood, Mage Wynn, Metal Crew, Michael B, Michael Henderson, Miguel El Amaro, Mike McMuscles, Mikey Tambourine, Mojave Jade, Moral, Morgan Harper, Mungo Jerry, Nagru, Nathaniel Clark, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Necro Anal Crusher, Negative Creep, Nick Johnson, Octo, Pagan Butler, Peach, Pentagon Black, Perennial Astronaut, Phoenix Flames, Frand, Pinky, Piotr Skubawa, Poet Russell, Pommy, Popeye Bark, Prod Mage, QL 2040, Quirky Top Hat, Rachel Rose, Rasmus Karras, Raul Vidal, Red, Red Okebi, Reflect, Rayo Palmiste, Replica, Kant, Ruben, Robert Chernovsky, Robert McMahon, Robert Scotland, Roosevelt Hoover IV, Ryan Malone, Saint, Samantha Wells, Sammy 3D, Sarah Denman, Scott Valine, Sean Bradford, Shazbot101, Shempamite, Shantiva, Someone Finally Pays Me, Sparkle, Summerstorm, Sweeneasy, Tayano Sandman, That One Guy, That Putty You Like Is Going To Come Back In Style, That Taffer, This Sid Four, Thomas Caldickery, Thy Rourke, Timothy, Tony Brandt, Tony Gleed, Soros, Unpolished Mirror, VK, Van the Cheesen, Vincent Liu, Vlad M, Vukrules, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Webgoth, Who Done It, Widukind, Wilhelm Schroederheim, Will M, William Riker, Walrek, Zan, Extreme Steve, Yossarian, Yuki Sian, Zachary Schulstad, Zane Break, and Ziklau for being a patron. Thank you so much for being there, uh, especially during an emergency situation where I, I needed to have some measure of stability or something to fall back onto, and you're literally like the net that kept me from dying. And this, by extension, this channel dying, I guess. That's probably why you're here. Um, but you know, just think of it as like a secondary benefit that you also keep me alive. And I appreciate that a lot, actually. So thanks again, and I'll uh, get busy working on other stuff. Um, bye. Oh, no!